This is Self Work, and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we'll discuss psychological and emotional issues common in today's world and what to do about them. I'm Dr. Margaret, and Self Work is a podcast dedicated to you taking just a few minutes today for your own self work. Hello, and welcome or welcome back to Self Work. I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. I'm a clinical psychologist, and I've worked in Fayetteville, Arkansas since 1993, moving here from Dallas. I started a podcast three years ago now, or almost three years ago, to extend the walls of my practice so that I could talk with others about their interest in psychological and emotional issues. Maybe they were in therapy, where I could offer to people who'd been recently diagnosed some information that might be helpful to them. And then there's that third group, those people who might never darken the door of a therapist. In fact, maybe they even hold some stigma about mental health treatment, or maybe they don't even believe mental illness exists. Now, that person may not listen to this podcast, but I think there are people out there. In fact, some of you have told me that you are one of them that are curious enough and actually need help enough to listen to a podcast before you're ready to actually seek therapeutic treatment. I get it. I developed panic disorder in my, sort of my middle 20s, and it was four years before I went to treatment because I didn't want to believe that anything was wrong with me. But as it crept more and more into my life, I remember well the night that I was going to a party where a lot of my friends were, and I opened the door and I had a full-blown panic attack and left. It was at that point that I said, I've got to admit that something's wrong. And so... I went for help. And luckily, after eh, one bad therapist, (laughs) I got some really good help. So whatever group you're a member of, or maybe you're in a whole different group, I'm really glad you're here. Today we're going to be talking about invisibility, or when who you are, your very being, your needs, your desires, aren't noticed by your parents, your family, or maybe even your friends. When I began thinking about doing this podcast, I was sort of headed in one direction. But then I had to stop and realize that there were many ways of feeling invisible. And I wanted to try to touch on several of them, but this list will still likely not be complete. But it's an important topic because one of the somewhat disconcerting things about being in therapy for some is that you will be seen, or if it's good therapy, you will be seen. So, A lot of the patients who come in to me and they recognize finally that they felt invisible as children or they feel invisible in their current relationship or they feel invisible at work, that when I help them begin to see themselves and I see them, then that is a huge part of their own understanding of how they're operating. So today we're going to cover ways that you can end feeling invisible. Everything from parents who were so into each other that they didn't direct much energy toward their children to being a certain gender or race in an environment where you're not respected or certainly you are stereotyped to being a victim of sexual abuse and objectification to being the child who never caused any problems and was basically taken for granted because other siblings' bad behavior got oodles of attention. There are a few more, and again, this won't be a complete list, but we can start the conversation And of course, we're going to talk about what you can do about it. I try in almost every episode, if I'm talking about a problem, I also try to help you understand that you need to look for what you have control over because usually there is something you can do about it. Our listener email today, which is a regular feature of self-work, is from a woman who's enjoyed some great couples work with her husband. They made a lot of progress, but sees him withdrawing from dealing with some of his own past. And she asks me what she should do. So sit back and relax with me. Many of you listen to this on your way to work, or even some of you tune in as you're going to sleep. So I hope that the information today will be helpful, and certainly I hope it will be if you're one of those people who feels invisible. A lot of people feel invisible in this world, and for many, many different reasons. So today, we're going to talk about several, and again, stress. What, if anything, you can do about it. What do I mean by feeling invisible? Like you don't matter. As if you aren't a vital part of things. As if you're being overlooked or seen only for what you can do instead of for who you are. 
you know that those of you who've been listening to my podcast about perfectly hidden depression know that that's exactly how they feel. If it's part of classic depression, then some of that invisibility may be imagined or misperceived because of your self-esteem being so low or your worth being so low or you compare yourself to others all the time. Some of that may be your own issue. Maybe you are important to people, but you're taking their own lives being busy or not texting you back or whatever too personally. But today's topic isn't necessarily on depression. It's about the invisibility of feeling like people see right through you and don't see you. And that can be reality, not necessarily depression. Just know, however, that it's an important distinction to make. And you may want to check out your thinking with a therapist or someone you trust if you're telling yourself you don't matter to people and you actually do. There are many ways to feel invisible. Let's first talk about the ones that may be culturally driven. Here's number one. You can feel invisible because of your gender, your race, your age, your economic or marital status. It may be that others have put you in a box because of some attribute or characteristic about you. But that attribute is only the fact of who you are, like your gender, your race, your age. All of those are boxes you can't get out of. I had a black male patient years ago who was a big guy, very dark-skinned, and he was about the jolliest, most emotionally sincere guy you'd ever meet. But I'll never forget when he told me one time, I'm so tired of seeing fear in people's eyes at night when I approach them on the street. He was far from being seen for who he was. And frequently, for example, older women especially talk about feeling more and more invisible as they get further away physically from the cultural norms of beauty. There are countries in which age is respected and honored, but the U.S. isn't necessarily one of them. So there are many reasons that you can feel invisible. The second, you can feel invisible if you're hiding who you really are. For example, if you keep secret being gay or some sort of passion or stand that you take, at least inwardly. I've worked with several gay people who may be choosing to not be open about their gender preferences, but they'll also say to me, There's a huge part of who I am that no one sees, no one knows, and it's tremendously lonely. They fear the repercussions of family, their workplace, or their culture, understandably, sadly. I've also heard this kind of loneliness and invisibility from those who may hold a differing social or political opinion from what is the norm in their environment. And they also feel that who they really are has to stay cloaked from the world. Again, that may be part of their growing up, that they keep who they are to themselves, or they have a fear of exposure when it really doesn't exist. But often, they might be rejected if they said who they are, so they feel invisible. The third is, again, this cultural way of getting there. You're seen as what you do, not who you are, especially if you're in a service role. You're the waiter or the nail lady. You're providing a service, and you're not seen at all. This, of course, is is rude and entitled behavior by the person who's treating you that way, but there are a lot of rude and entitled people out there. I had a woman as a patient the other day who was talking to me about this, and she said that she'd gotten her nails done by a young Vietnamese woman, and she'd been told her name was a very Americanized name. And she looked at her and she said, Would you tell me your Vietnamese name, please? And the girl's eyes filled with tears, and she said, You don't know how many people have no interest in who I am, what my name really is, or what my experience has been. The only thing they'll say to me is if I get a little nail polish on their finger. And so we can stop seeing the people around us. This is also true in medical settings. You're the patient, or in other environments, you're seen as the next person. Next, next. (laughs) I had shoulder surgery several years ago, and I overheard one of the nurses or someone say, Rutherford, the rotator cuff in bed seven. What? I'm not my rotator cuff. But you're seen as a condition, not as you. Or when you're in settings where there are a lot of people, you're the next one. And unless you're going through the line doing everything you can to get attention, you won't get any. Maybe some people make their lives more simple by deciding who they're going to notice and who they're not. They make their jobs easier by not noticing someone's humanity, but by labeling them which is a way of objectifying them, which is something we'll talk about later. 
I recognize that many medical professionals or other kinds of people who care for others probably do this in order to protect themselves against some of the horror of their jobs, like firemen and women, police officers, ambulance drivers, not only doctors and nurses, but it can feel really horrible when you're on the receiving end. Now let's talk about invisibility that may have gotten started in childhood. Let's say your parents neglected you. It's interesting to note that neglect may not be what you think of as neglect. There are certainly parents who are too busy trying to make ends meet or too addicted to meth or whatever they're addicted to to give a flip about their kids. And they abandon them for hours on end. Or they have their meth friends sitting around while they're actually cooking meth in the kitchen and there are the kids. That's neglect. Of course, this is horrible and actually can be tremendously damaging to those children who absorb that they have no real worth. And yet they're not being hit or screamed at. They're just ignored. It can be very confusing. Another manner of neglect is when parents are so into each other that the needs of their children simply aren't on the top of the list, ever. These folks will say things like, My parents were there. They fed me and clothed me. But we never did anything as a family. We were just there. This obviously has tremendous consequences for the rest of your life. Number six is in your childhood, you adopted a strategy to stay invisible due to your parents' addictions or abuse. This is a close cousin to my previous words about neglect. A child can choose to remain invisible as an unconscious strategy in order to stay safe. You're not being neglected necessarily, but the risk of punishment for inconsequential crimes is so great, you choose to stay out of the way. Your invisibility protects you. You often can continue this pattern in your adulthood. This can also happen in families where emotions are not allowed to be discussed, especially painful emotions, where the family is just on automatic. So it's not necessarily addictions or abuse. It is about families that sweep everything under the rug and the parents don't tune into their children in any real way. They're just kind of there. And what is absorbed is a lot of shame. I guess I shouldn't want to cry. I guess I shouldn't be angry. So I'll just stay quiet. Another way invisibility can be born is if you're the good child. I recently had a session with someone who looked at me very plaintively and said, you know, I'm a twin sister. I've always obviously been a twin and I don't know any life other than that. But why is it that I've never caused my parents any trouble? I've always gotten good grades. I've got a great job. I've always been a really good daughter and granddaughter. But everyone always talks about my sister, who's done none of that, but seems to receive all the kudos for the least little thing she manages to do. It seems so unfair. So basically, you've got sort of a sibling or someone who is struggling, and the family focuses mostly on whatever they do well and completely, and you sort of fall through the cracks like, oh, that's Jane. Jane always does well. And you don't get the praise or the even affirmation that you need. So you feel invisible. In this kind of invisibility, you may have worked harder and harder to gain some kind of attention, not realizing that it's highly likely that your role in the family has become very entrenched. You're the one where your parents never have to go to emergency parent-teacher conferences. So in this case, you'll likely strive for perfection again, as in perfectly hidden depression, and may feel very supported professionally and definitely seen, but the hurts from family run deep. Here's the eighth one. You're one of many children, or you're just not the favorite child. I've certainly heard this kind of invisibility from adults who as children were one of a brood of kids. Sometimes there's acceptance of this, like, My mom did the best she could, or my dad and mom did the best they could. There were just a lot of mouths to feed. But even if you came from a smaller family, if your parents had favorites, or as I try to help some people see, maybe the fit between one parent and one child was much more easy than it was with you, although you can come out of that dynamic still absorbing shame from that and have to work on it. But you can feel resentful and invisible. We used to believe that middle children would belong in this bracket just by the fact that they're middle children, but that myth has been deposed, that they're actually strengths of being a middle child, and I'll have a link to that in the show notes. The ninth is that you were or are shy. I've often wondered if being shy should be a diagnostic category. 
Research has shown that it's different than being introverted. Shyness is social anxiety, which is severely paralyzing at times and can be tied to physical symptoms like stomach problems. I'm posting a link to an article that talks about this difference. I thought the article described it well, saying that introverts can act extroverted. It's just not their preferred way of spending time. But shyness can't be turned on and off. The last way you can begin to feel invisible is if you're being treated like an object, where you're the victim of narcissism or sexual abuse or exploitation of some kind. Exploiters or abusers will look for people who take immense responsibility in relationships or when the given situation is one where they can grab immediate power. So when you begin being treated like an object, whether as a child or as an adult, you can lose sight of your own value. You're being exploited for sex or what you can do for someone else, what purpose you serve for them. And the more that occurs, the more invisible you will feel. And yet, there are times that your perpetrator or your narcissistic partner will tell you how important you are to them, how special you are. And that can blind you even more to the dynamic of what's happening. It can be a vicious cycle and one that is very hard to see. Your worth plummets, and you can become more and more dependent on the crumbs they offer from time to time to feel it all worthy or important. So obviously, we've talked about lots of different varieties of feeling invisible, Let's first talk about the cultural ones. I'm giving you a link to a Deepak Chopra article on Oprah.com where he talks about a distinct plan to try to figure out what may be your own mind convincing you that you're invisible and an analysis of what you can try to do about it. He suggests, as I do a lot, that looking for what you have control over is paramount and making a list of what you can actually do to figure out what may be your own insecurity and what could be the steps toward solution of the problem. If you feel invisible because of your age or your gender or because you're divorced, then where can you go? What can you create that will help you feel more connected? Are you making assumptions that need to be addressed? The young black man I discussed earlier created a large Facebook following in his local area, so he began feeling much more well-known and supported and not so much defined by the looks of those who didn't know him. You can invite a group of people of like gender, like race, or like marital status and form a support group, do things together, or you can do the opposite. I joined a book club with much younger women in it than me many years ago, and although I was nervous at first, I found that it didn't matter as much as I feared. So you need to look and see if you're closeting yourself off or if you're truly living with invisibility that you can't do too much about culturally, but you can look for what is under your control. If your invisibility was caused by childhood experiences, this one may be more complicated because what we experienced in childhood runs very deep. One of my most popular podcast episodes deals specifically with this. It's episode 12, How to Become an Emotional Grown-Up. You can work with a therapist or do your own work or your self-work and begin to know what you learned and experienced as a child in the past directly affects your life in the present. There's another episode on creating a timeline that could be helpful as well. Please check these out. That episode is 109. You really want to challenge and confront what you absorbed because you are not invisible. You don't need to be. You don't have to live out your life like that. If you've been exploited, you first have to identify the abuse as abuse. You have to see narcissism as narcissism and exploitation as exploitation. Leaving those relationships isn't as easy as one might think. But perhaps the most important thing to remember is that whatever shame you feel, that you should have stopped it, that you should have left, those statements to yourself only keep your sense of worth in the trash. It's frightening to leave. There may be threats of actual physical violence against you or your children, your exploiter has told you over and over that you couldn't make it on your own, please don't minimize those things. But know that you will not be invisible to people who truly care about you. And I've listed three other links of episodes that are on these dynamics. Please look at yourself today in the mirror and know that you're not invisible, not to the people who truly care. You may have to confront in yourself how to begin to find those people if you're shy, how to reach out just enough. How you've been put in a box to find people who'll see you. 
how to break a stereotype or look for others who don't have to have stereotypes to function. There was a time years ago when my son was in the hospital with a collapsed lung. He was 18, but he needed guidance from us as he was having to make decisions about a pretty serious surgery. One of the doctors came into the room, only talked to my husband and son, and then would walk out. Even if I asked questions, I was ignored. After a few hours of this treatment, I found him at the nurse's station, my heart absolutely pounding out of my chest. I asked him to talk with me. He looked up somewhat guardedly. I said, listen. We're on the same team, but you need to talk with me as well. I don't know why you're not including me, but I need your help, and my son needs me. So let's go forward from here. He looked down, and much to my amazement, he said, I've been told that before, and I'll do better. I'm sorry. And he did do better. Now, that outcome was good, but it certainly might have turned out differently. I tried to approach with respect and assertiveness, and it turned out okay. What I'm recommending is that you look for what you have control over. Make an action plan. Life is far too short to feel invisible. Here's our listener email. First, she thanks me, which is so nice. And then she says, I have a question about couples therapy. My husband and I have been going to therapy together for about a year and a half now. We love our therapist and trust her completely. Our marriage has improved greatly, and we are much happier from the help we've received. My only concern is that I've noticed my husband becoming very anxious and pulling back when it comes to exploring the root cause of his emotional issues. He's able to talk about his difficulties growing up with overly emotional and angry parents, but he doesn't like getting very deep into it. I have my own therapist and have been doing work on processing emotions that stem from my own childhood, so I know how life-changing it can be. Is it wrong for me to try and open up that Pandora's box while we are in session? I feel like it would be invading his privacy in a way and that he may resent going to therapy because of it. So I write back, hi, I'm so glad the podcast is helpful. I might suggest that you support your husband going to his own individual therapy to address these issues first. I've had several men come into therapy after being in couples therapy, but by themselves to do this kind of work. Or your couples therapist could suggest someone. It may be that whatever the issue is, he's not quite ready to explore his childhood with you present or maybe even at all. He may even fear that it might unbalance the great work you two have done. But one of the things I also hear in your question is somewhat of a yearning for your husband to be at the same place you are. And even though I understand that yearning, you may have to give him time and space to work on his own issues. If he sees the kind of benefit it's given you, then perhaps that's the best gift you can give him, that it's been helpful to you, that his life is better because of the work you've done, and so is yours, and that maybe that will serve, again, as motivation for him to seek help himself. I want to thank you for being here today at Self Work. My email is askdrmargaret at drmargaretrutherford.com, and please feel free to send me confidential messages there. My website is drmargaretrutherford.com, and you can subscribe there and receive weekly blog posts and these podcast episodes. It's really an easy way to keep up with me. Thanks so much for ratings and reviews that keep on coming in. I appreciate it more than you know. My new book, Perfectly Hidden Depression, can be pre-ordered at perfectlyhiddendepression.com. And if you're interested in the topic or you identify with it, I'd so appreciate you going on and buying it now. It kind of creates a little bit of a buzz. and That's important, I hear, in the publishing industry. I don't know much about it, my first book. I'm over on Instagram at drmarketrutherford.com, and I do have a closed group. It's about a year old now at facebook.com slash groups slash self-work. I go and come a lot. But gosh, the members of the group themselves really are supportive of one another and also respectful of diversity. Thanks so much for listening. Take very good care. I'm Dr. Margaret, and this has been Self Work. Self Work.